Hi everyone, I'm going to talk about lossiness and entropic hardness for Ring LWE. I'm Tzvika and this is joint work with Nico Dutling. So let's start by talking about the learning with errors problem, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. Learning with errors is essentially the problem of solving uh, a system of approximate random linear equations modulo Q. So let's be a little more concrete. So we have this matrix A that I have on the slide. This is a short and wide matrix N by M uh, using my notation. And think of M as some polynomial in N. And this matrix is uniform modulo Q. Q is going to be some global modulus that's going to remain unspecified in the talk. Uh, it actually ranges from being polynomial in N to being exponential in N. Uh, but you can just think about this being some large polynomial in N uh, for the purpose of the talk. So we have this random matrix A, and this gets multiplied by a secret vector S, and S is also uniform modulo Q. Now this product S times A, um, to that we add a noise vector E. So E is a vector of IID elements, and these are sampled from a noise distribution, um, which is supported only over elements that are much, much smaller than Q in absolute value. And this SA plus E uh, mod Q is denoted by B. This is going to be the outcome of this system of linear equations, approximate linear equations. And the learning with errors problem in the search version is the problem of uh, given A and B to find the values of the variables of the system of equations uh, S. Um, and there's also the decision version, which is also going to be important for us. And this is the problem of distinguishing A and B from A and U, where U is just a uniform uh, vector that has nothing to do with S and E. And again, as many of you probably know, uh, learning with errors has been super useful for cryptography. Uh, it has a simple linear algebraic structure that allows to use it very easily and provides strong security properties, uh, such as presumed post-quantum security and worst case to average case hardness reductions. Uh, and this makes it uh, an invaluable tool for a building block for um, many, uh, cryptographic, uh, many cryptographic constructions. However, in many cases, uh, LWE is not efficient enough to be used uh, in schemes that are designed for the real world. And for this, pr this purpose, in order to improve efficiency, there are variants of LWE uh, that rely on uh, algebraic number theory, and they provide greater efficiency. In particular, the ring LWE problem is uh, such a variant, and this is going to be the focus of the, this work and also of this talk. However, uh, in order to make everybody's life easier, there's not going to be any algebraic number theory in the talk. Rather, we're going to present an abstraction that will allow us to, um, um, to talk about these uh, algebraic, uh, algebraic number theory variants without, um, without thinking about polynomial rings and things of this sort. We call our abstraction structured LWE, and it goes as follows. So at, at, at first, I'm just going to change the notation. Rather than thinking about A as one um, wide matrix, uh, I'm going to partition it into square blocks, A1 and A2 and so forth. And I'm also going to partition the vector E and the vector B into chunks accordingly. So now rather than thinking about LWE as finding S given A and B, I can think about it as the problem of uh, finding S given um, a collection of pairs A, I, and B, I. And likewise, I can also define the decision version in a similar manner. So now I can say that uh, in standard LWE, it's, uh, uh, standard LWE is a structured LWE problem where the distributions of, of the A, I is uniform and of the E, I's is Gaussian. But now I can start playing with the problem by changing the distributions of the A, I, and E, I, and thus get the different variants. So the ring LWE problem, which is the focus of this work, and also the related polynomial LWE problem, can be presented also as structured LWE, but now rather than the AI being uniform, the AI is drawn from a distribution that represents um, multiplication by a random ring element. And since ring multiplication is a bilinear operation, this can actually be represented uh, as a matrix where uh, matrix multiplication represents the multiplication over the ring. And these, uh, this class of matrices actually forms a multilinear group, which is going to be important for us. The vectors EI are still going to be Gaussians, but they're not going to be IAD Gaussians. They can be slightly weird Gaussians uh, according to the geometry of the ring, but this is not going to matter much for us for the purpose of the talk. 
so this allows us to uh, define ring LWE uh, in, in the form of uh, structured LWE, which is what we need for, for this work and for the talk. But let me just point out that there are other variants of LWE that can be thought of uh, using this abstraction. Uh, for example, module LWE, middle product LWE, and order LWE are also cases where the multiplication, uh, it's an LWE variant where the multiplication is this uh, um, has this bilinear form and can therefore be represented by matrix multiplication. Uh, so we don't make use of this and makes use of this in this work, but this could be interesting to, to think about um, independently. In this work, we study entropic hardness for ring LWE, but let's start by talking about entropic hardness for structured LWE in general, so not distinguish between the different flavors. And the question here is what happens when S is not sampled from a uniform distribution, but rather, rather from some other distribution? And the first question, I guess, is why should we even care? So one case where this could be useful is that of leakage resilience. So sometimes S is used as a secret key for some uh, cryptographic scheme, and we can consider a case when, where an adversary obtains some partial information about S. So the distribution of S now in the eyes of the adversary is no longer uniform, and the question is whether the scheme remains secure. Another case uh, is that uh, um, sometimes, for example, in fully homomorphic encryption, using a different distribution for S gives you better functionality as well as better efficiency. And in that case, for example, it is sometimes useful to sample S from a binary distribution uh, rather than um, um, a uniform distribution. And this sort of uh, leads us to the distributions that we should care about uh, in, the, in the context of entropic LWE. So, um, of course, it's obvious that uh, the distribution has to have sufficient entropy, non-trivial entropy. Otherwise, the LWE problem is obviously not hard. Uh, and we could care about um, small or binary distributions for S. So S is sampled not uniformly over the entire domain, but only over elements that are small or only over binary elements. And the other case is sort of general entropic distributions where we don't know what the exact distribution is, but all we know is that it has sufficient entropy. All right, so now that we hopefully care, uh, what is the answer? Is the problem uh, still secure or not? Well, for standard LWE, there is a sequence of, of known results that essentially establishes hardness uh, for small and binary uh, distributions, and recently also for general entropic distributions. So this is good. However, for ring LWE, almost nothing is known, and I'm going to go back to this almost later on. And the question is why? Like, why, can't we not, why can we not, since these problems are so similar, why can we not uh, sort of translate the techniques from the LWE regime to hold also for ring LWE? So let's start by going over the main, the main ideas that allow us to prove entropic hardness for standard LWE. And actually, all of these works that are mentioned here use the same basic idea, which is to rely on lossiness in order to prove entropic hardness. So what is this idea? So the idea is to replace the AI with a different distribution, which is still going to be computationally indistinguishable, but this new distribution uh, is going to be over matrices that are going to lose some information about S in this uh, multiplication process. And this is going to help uh, in improving entropic hardness, as we will see in a minute. In particular, the distribution that is, uh, that is normally used is to replace the AI by essentially an LWE instance by itself. So we're going to sample uh, a global uniform matrix B. And as you can see, B is going to be a very narrow matrix. It's going to have the same number of rows in a as AI, but it's going to be very narrow and it's going to be universal. There's only going to be one B in the system. There's not going to be a BI. And now for each I, we're going to sample, sample a CI, which is going to be a matrix of the appro appropriate dimensions so that B times CI has the same dimension as AI. So, it's, so B times CI is going to be a square matrix. And CI is going to be a random and secret matrix. And to that, we're going to add F FI, which is just a matrix of IID noise, just as in uh, the, just as in LWE. And the LWE assumption, the decisional version of LWE, actually asserts that this distribution is going to be computationally indistinguishable from the uniform distribution, which is the prescribed distribution of the AI. So we can make the substitution um, and, and still remain uh, computationally indistinguishable from the, original, from the original distribution. Now let's see why making the substitution actually helps improving entropic hardness. So from this point and on, the argument is going to be information theoretic. So we're going to show that once we replace the distribution of the AIs, even a computationally unbounded adversary is not able to recover uh, is not able to recover uh, the value of S uh, given these samples. So let's see what kind of information uh, the adversary can actually learn about S when it is given S times AI plus EI, and also, of course, AI by itself. 
So let's see what we know about what we what an adversary, uh, an unbounded adversary, can learn about s. So the first thing that the adversary learns is this value s times b. So uh, and uh, this just uh, uh, this term just appears in all of the whenever you have s times ai, you get s times b times ci plus s times fi. So uh, s times b uh, is a value that uh, potentially leaks. Um, however, since the since b is a very narrow matrix, s times b has a very um, small dimension, and therefore s times b does not leak a lot of information about s. So this is a bounded amount of information. The second thing that is leaked is all these terms of the form s times fi, and um, I also want to add to that the ei that also uh, that also exists in this because this is actually going to be important. Um, so once um, so given given s times b and s times fi plus ei, this is actually all of the information uh, that an unbounded adversary can learn about s from um, from these from these samples, and. Um, this is where sort of all of these approaches that we have here diverge, how to deal with S times Fi plus Ei. And what I'm going to describe here uh, is this uh, um, approach, is the approach we had in a previous work with Nico, where we had this technique that we called um, um, so flooding, that we called flooding at the source. And uh, what, we, what we did there was the following. So we said the, um, we considered the noise EI, so the, the noise from the LWE sample, and we actually showed that you can pull some from this Gaussian EI, you can pull a smaller Gaussian and push it back uh, before the FI. So this distribution S times FI plus EI is actually statistically identical to a distribution where you take S, add, to, add, add a Gaussian E prime to S, take the sum of these two things, multiply that by FI, and then add some e double prime i. And note that the e prime is just a global value. It does not depend on i. Only the e double prime depend on i. And this means that even a computationally unbounded adversary cannot obtain more information about s uh, than, it, than can be obtained from s plus e prime. Because you never sort of see s naked, uh, you, you can only see it with the addition of, uh, with the addition of e prime. And this led us to define this notion of noise lossiness, which is the amount of information on S, uh, which is sampled from some, some distribution, which is lost when you add Gaussian noise to it. And uh, what, we, uh, what we showed was that this noise lossiness actually sort of dictates uh, the entropic hardness of the LWE problem that you have. So you have the, the lossiness that comes from the noise lossiness. Uh, and on the other hand, you have this additional uh, sort of side information that uh, uh, comes from this S times B. And so long as S times B does not give you sufficient information to sort of recover from the noise lossiness, then you're going to have entropic hardness because the adversary is not going to be able to recover the original S. And we see that noise lossiness, we can see that noise lossiness actually has sort of the properties that we would expect uh, when, we talk, when we talk about entropic hardness. So, First of all, uh, the more entropy that S has, the better noise lossiness it is going to have. And intuitively think about it, this actually means that the distribution of S is sort of more dense in the space of all possible S's. And this means that when we, ha when we add Gaussian noise to it, it is more likely to get confused between some value of S and some neighboring value of S. Likewise, if S has smaller Euclidean norm, this is also going to be better because, again, now this uh, smaller norm means that the space of possible S's is smaller. It's just going to be this small ball that contains all the elements uh, with, with small norm. And therefore, again, if you add, Gauss, if, if you add a Gauss into it, you're st sort of still sort of dense in this ball. And therefore, it is more likely for you to get confused between a given S and a neighboring S. Lastly, uh, notice that the uh, Gaussian parameter of the noise EI is also going to matter because the amount of E prime that we are able to sort of pull back uh, uh, through the FI is actually going to depend on the amount of noise in the EI that we have. So the larger the noise in the LWE uh, sample that you have, the better parameters you're going to get for, um, uh, for, the, entropic, for the entropic hardness, which also makes sense. Um, so this is the notion of noise lossiness. And uh, this uh, sort of is one way to sort of address the problem in the context of standard LWE. Uh, however, if you try to apply it to ring LWE, you see that you run into a problem. And the reason is that um, 
what we do here is replace the matrix AI with a matrix which is close to a low rank matrix in the sense that uh, this distribution that we have, this LWE distribution, is a low rank matrix, B times CI, that's a low rank matrix, plus some noise. And in fact, the, the structure of, of ring LWE, so if we think about it as uh, a structured LWE problem, we said that the AI here is going, to be, um, is going to be a ring multiplication matrix. And ring multiplication matrix can just cannot have uh, the form of being a low rank matrix plus some noise. So we can just not make the substitution in the context of ring LWE. Um, and now perhaps it's the time to talk about this exception. So uh, there is uh, uh, one work with uh, Bolbocheno, um, Perlman, and uh, uh, Sharma, where uh, we show that in a very specific case, so the case where the modulus sort of splits completely over the ring, and using a very non-standard assumption, we can actually get some entropic hardness result uh, for ring LWE. And in that particular case, you can actually, you can think about it as presenting uh, the, the AI matrix as uh, sort of low rank plus noise, uh, plus low rank, low rank plus noise matrix, uh, but this requires um, uh, a non-standard assumption. All right, so let's see how we can get around this problem and actually get lossiness for ring LWE. So we said that we wanted to replace AI with uh, a close to low rank matrix, but we cannot do it. So how about trying to be more bold and try to replace AI with a close to zero rank matrix? So just maybe try to get AI to be computationally indistinguishable from a short matrix FI. Well, this of course doesn't work because AI is not a short matrix. However, we make the observation that what actually matters is the row span of F uh, and not F itself. So what we're going to do is replace the matrix AI with a matrix that has in its row span a short matrix. In particular, we're going to take AI and replace it with a product H times ZI, where H is going to be a global big matrix, and ZI is going to be a short matrix, and the row span of this matrix actually contains ZI, which, as we are going to see, this is going to give us what we want. Now, this actually does not offend the structure of the AI as a ring multiplication operation, because we can sample H and ZI also as ring multiplication for a ring element, um, so H is going to be for a large ring element, and ZI is going to be for a short ring element, and their product is also going to correspond to um, uh, a ring multiplication matrix for uh, the corresponding, the, the product of these two ring elements. So in terms of structure, we can do this. We don't run into the problem that we had before when we were trying to do low rank plus noise. So this is already a good thing. Now, um, we also notice that this is actually um, not, I mean, this is not a new assumption, and actually, I mean, the way that we got to it is actually in the reverse route. Um, you can actually present known assumptions such as the entry assumption or DSPR, the decisional uh, short polynomial ratio problem, as um, exactly exactly in this form, uh, where the the um, H and ZI sort of represent um, um, represent uh, ring element multiplication for the appropriate ring elements. And we should also notice. Uh, that um, this uh, sort of idea, we, uh, we learned this idea of uh, sort of replacing AI with, uh, say, an n true instance was used in a survey in the LWE survey of PyCart to relate the hardness of n true uh, with the hardness of ring LWE. Uh, but we are actually going to use uh, this, uh, we are going to show that this can be used in order to show entropic hardness. Also notice that um, the, the assumption can have many flavors. In particular, um, we, we might want to make, uh, we say that ZI is short, but the question is how short. So the shorter ZI is, the better it is for us, the, the better lossiness we're going to get. And this is, not surprisingly, going to make the assumption stronger. However, uh, if we only care about, if we only want a mild, uh, mild ZIs, uh, which are going to be good enough to get some entropic hardness, we can actually uh, see that this assumption, this DSPR assumption, actually converges with ring LWE. So we are going to be able to get entropic hardness, um, not the strongest possible results, but by just assuming the ring LWE problem itself. Uh, but if we want the sort of stronger um, if we want stronger entropic hardness, we need to make stronger assumptions such as DSPR. All right, let's see what information about S, a computationally unbounded adversary, can deduce after we make the substitution uh, of, H, of AI with H times ZI. So note that an unbounded uh, adversary gets, uh, the, um, gets to see all of the AIs and therefore it can uh, derive H out of it. So H is not secret to an unbounded adversary. So the unbounded adversary, what it sees is S times H times ZI plus EI for a bunch of I's. And again, we're going to use the technique of flooding at the source. 
and we're going to pull out of the EI uh, the, this, uh, addition, this noise term E prime uh, such that we can write uh, the um, SHZI plus EI as, well, we have this term in a bracket, S times H plus E prime, where E prime is global. All of this gets multiplied by ZI, and then you get some additional, you add some additional E double prime I. Um, but once we do this, we notice that all the information about S is actually contained inside the bracket. So actually all the adversary, all an unbounded adversary learns about S is this term S times H plus E prime. So um, this, the fact that it's a sequence of elements and so forth is not going to matter for us for now, from, from now on. And when we look at this, we see that this already gives us some flavor of entropic hardness. So we could, uh, uh, let's think about defining um, S times H, noting it by S prime. So what we have in the bracket is uh, S H plus E prime. So this is actually S prime plus E prime. And we notice now that if S prime has good noise lossiness, then we get entropic hardness. Why is that? Well, if S prime has high noise lossiness, then this means that a computationally unbounded adversary cannot derive S prime from seeing S prime plus E prime. However, since H is just a global invertible matrix, this means that if you cannot, uh, if the adversary cannot deduce S prime, then it also cannot deduce S. So if S prime has high noise lossiness, then uh, we are in good shape. Um, and this is already useful because again, since uh, multiplying by H is an invertible transformation, uh, the entropy of the distribution of S prime is going to be the same as the entropy of distribution of S. And since we know that all high entropy distributions are going to have, well, pretty good noise lossiness, then um, if we know that S has sufficiently high entropy, then this means that even though we don't know H, S prime uh, is whatever H is, S prime is also going to have sufficiently high entropy and therefore it's going to have pretty good noise lossiness. So this already gives us um, some uh, entropic hardness for general entropic distributions. However, what we want is to relate the entropic hardness to the noise lossiness of S itself, which will allow us to get better results. For example, this will allow us to um, get better results for S with, uh, with low norm which is sort of the ultimate result that we want to get, a result that is comparable to what we know uh, in the standard LWE setting. So let's recap. Um, the information that an unbounded adversary has about S is S times H plus E prime. And we want to somehow relate this to the noise lossiness of S itself. So remember the noise lossiness uh, is what information about S is lost when you just add um, Gaussian noise to S, not to S, uh, to S times H. So in order, to, um, in order to do that, we recall an additional property of the n or DSPR assumptions. And actually this, is, this can be uh, derived without loss, without loss of generality uh, from the assumption, the way we described it. So you can assume without loss of generality that the inverse of H mod Q is a matrix Z0, which is a short matrix by itself. So this is a global matrix and it's going to be short. Uh, and we're going to be able to use this property uh, in order to derive uh, our sort of ultimate result. So let's see how. So we know that mod Q, um, the inverse of H is a short matrix. So this means that we can take this entire uh, equation that we, has, we have, SH plus E prime, and multiply it by Z0. Now let's see what happens when we multiply by Z0. Well, the H cancels out, and know that this whole thing is done modulo Q. So the S, can S cancels out, and what we get is S plus E prime times Z0. Now, we get S plus something, which is good, which is what we want for noise lossiness. And this E prime times Z zero, well, it's going to be some kind of Gaussian. It's not exactly the Gaussian that we want. So E prime is like um, a, nice, a nice Gaussian. So you can think about it as continuous or uh, being over the integers. However, after you multiply by Z zero, what you get is a Gaussian over the lattice that is defined by the rows of Z zero, because, well, you get a linear combination of the rows of Z zero. And um, this is not the Gaussian that we, uh, that we have in the definition of noise lossiness. Um, and furthermore, we need to take into account that this Gaussian can be sort of very far from being spherical. So it depends on the properties of Z0. So actually what we need to do is uh, sort of conditioned on the case where Z0 has sort of nice singular values so that E prime times Z0 is a Gaussian over the lattice Z0, which is close to being spherical. And in order to do that, we need to define a notion that is called sometimes lossiness. We showed that this holds with some non-negligible probability, but not necessarily
actually probability close to one, and we show that this is uh, this actually suffices in order to show uh, entropic hardness. So this is an additional technical difficulty, uh, but let me not get into the details. So going slightly back, uh, we have s plus e prime times z zero, and e prime times z zero is a Gaussian over the lattice z zero. So let's try to sort of see how this um, uh, how this expression relates to the expression of noise lossiness, where noise lossiness is just how much information about S is lost when you just add like, you know, a standard Gaussian, not a Gaussian over a lattice. So um, how much information about S is leaked with uh, a Gaussian over a lattice? Well, we notice that you can notice that you are going to get more information than what you get from the standard noise lossiness. Because in particular, we can take this expression, uh, S plus E prime times Z zero, and uh, sort of reduce it modulo the lattice itself. So we can check which coset of the lattice Z zero this expression uh, this expression belongs to. And the coset of the lattice Z zero of this expression is the same as the coset of this is this the same as the coset of Z zero of S itself. So the coset of S within the lattice Z zero is something uh, that can be deduced from uh, S plus E prime uh, times e zero and cannot uh, and cannot be deduced if we just added sort of standard Gaussian noise to s. So uh, we get something we get some additional leakage on top of what sort of the noise lossiness tells us uh, that we're that we're going to get. So um, what we have here is that uh, to conclude uh, from this expression, the information about s that we lose is the noise lossiness. Well, here it says plus, but actually minus. Uh, the information that is contained in the coset of S. So you lose the information in the noise, loss, in the noise lossiness and possibly gain uh, the information that is obtained in the coset of S. So if the noise, but if the noise lossiness is large enough to actually um, uh, sort of compensate for this additional uh, information that is contained in the coset, then we're going to be in good shape. So we have this interest that uh, to, to choose the parameters so that uh, the lattice is zero has as few cosets as possible. What does it mean to have a few to have few cosets as possible? That the lattice is zero needs to be as dense as we can as dense as we can make it, which sort of translates to the matrix is zero being as short as we can make it. So the the shorter uh, the the smaller the elements of z zero are, the fewer cosets that it's going to have. And this sort of makes sense, right? Because the better results, the, the, because, well, a smaller Z0 sort of translates to into a, making a stronger hardness assumption. So in order to get better entropic results, we need to make a stronger hardness assumption, which sort of makes sense. So um, if we make a stronger and stronger hardness assumption, we can um, make Z0 smaller and smaller and make this loss, this loss that comes from the coset, uh, again, smaller and smaller. Uh, Annoyingly, we cannot take Z0 to be small enough um, so as to allow us to use binary distribution on S. So this leakage from the coset is large enough uh, so that no matter, um, sort of within reasonable parameters, we cannot uh, get uh, the noise lossiness to be good enough uh, to compensate for it when S uh, is a binary, when S is a binary distribution, simply because the binary distribution cannot have that much entropy. It, cannot, it can only have n bits of entropy. So the question of entropic ring LWE with a binary secret still remains open. Um, however, we did manage to relate uh, the entropic hardness of ring LWE to this notion of noise lossiness, plus this additional loss that comes from uh, the coset of S, which sort of translates the parameters of the uh, hardness assumption that we are making. So this is sort of the ultimate result that we have uh, in this work. All right, let's conclude. So what we saw here was that the notion of noise lossiness that was defined in previous work uh, in the context of LWE also implies entropic hardness uh, for the case of ring LWE. Um, and we need to compensate for this additional loss that comes from leaking the coset of S with respect to some lattice, uh, which is parameterized in the assumption. Uh, what is the assumption that we need, the hardness assumption that we need to make in order to get entropic hardness? Well, we can rely just on the standard ring LWE assumption, uh, and this is going to give us uh, entropic hardness uh, in the case where we, we initially start from sufficiently high noise lossiness for uh, our secret S, and in the case where the noise EI is sufficiently high. Uh, so this is going to already give us some uh, um, entropic hardness. If we want better parameters for entropic hardness, we need to make a stronger assumption, in particular this uh, uh, decisional uh, uh, short polynomial ratio assumption, 
this uh, is already going to give us entropic hardness for sort of modest uh, uh, noise lossiness uh, and uh, noise value for uh, for the ring LWE instance. And for sort of the ultimate parameters, if we want binary ring LWE, we still don't know. We still don't know how to get it. We don't know how to get our techniques to work for these uh, this parameter regime. So this is an interesting open problem. Um, we pre present this new abstraction, structured LWE. Um, so we actually thought about this abstraction only uh, for our convenience so that we don't need to sort of work with this uh, algebraic number theory in the entire paper. So we wanted to abstract things as much as possible for our own sake. Uh, but maybe it's an interesting, uh, maybe it's an interesting um, um, abstraction and maybe it can be useful elsewhere. Uh, maybe, for example, you can use this to show entropic hardness uh, for other variants of the, of the LWE problem. Um, and with that, I will leave you. Thank you very much.